Justine Greening, um, Rotherham born and bred. Very the, proud of that. The first in your family to go to university. You had some big jobs uh, in the Conservative Government Education Secretary, Economic Secretary to the Treasury, Transport Secretary, International Development Secretary. Um, but you, you sort of fell out of love with Boris Johnson's government before you stood down in 2019. What happened? Are you still a Conservative? I'm still a card-carrying member of the Conservative Party and we basically had the whip withdrawn. So it was probably more the party leadership falling out with me in a sense. Um, and I think obviously that was around Brexit and the fact that I represented a very Remain constituency and, and wanted to faithfully do that in my job as a constituency MP. Of course, the irony was the whip being withdrawn was the fact that I was really unhappy about the Northern Ireland protocol in the bill that the government was trying to get through Parliament. And um, I guess with hindsight, the government ended up sharing my concerns. But at the time, they weren't on the same page. But, you know, I was probably one of those people just flagging up that I was really worried about it not working. And that's that was correct. But, but no... Um, you know, I think Brexit was one of those issues where people were taking a particular a particular position. But on the broader levelling up, up work, um, Boris, Boris and I were 100% aligned on all of that and the priority. Your party's obviously, since you left and, and actually just in the run-up to your, you, you standing down from Parliament, has been through a turbulent uh, time. Um, we now have Rishi Sunak as Prime Minister. Did you vote for him, by the way? Oh, I've never said oh, okay. vote Fair for enough, fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. Can't blame him for trying. Um, I was interested in an article that you wrote for the Yorkshire Post uh, recently, last month. You said this, Sunak has sought to portray himself as a better manager as Prime Minister at 10 Downing Street. It's crucial, but not enough. This is the line that really interested me. Running Britain is not the same as leading it. Just expand on what you meant by that. I meant what I said. Um, I think in politics, if you really want to drive change and, and create a, a better version of Britain, which is for me what it's all about, there are times when you have to go, right, we're going this way. And there'll be some people who don't agree with everything you're doing. There'll be other people who think it's brilliant. But actually, it's just that sheer clarity and single-mindedness that I think the country needs right now, particularly on levelling up, which does require an ambitious policy agenda, but it is much, much more than that. It's about how businesses change and employers look at their opportunities. It's about almost society and what we should expect in terms of the opportunities we get in our lives. And that is a really fundamental different version of Britain. And, and in a sense, you're not just going to run, run Britain better and have it happen. People expect government to be run well. That's the least they expect. What they, I think, also want to see is a really very different, fairer version of Britain created after Brexit. I think this sense of take back control was actually people saying, I don't feel if I work really hard that I get on anymore. And that's not acceptable. And for me, that's as much about a levelling up agenda as it was about our country's relationship with Europe. And so that's the agenda I think Sunak really needs to passionately say, I am going to do this and I'm going to drive change and I'm going to crack a few eggs to make an omelette. I'm going to, I'm going to do what it takes to deliver for the communities like we grew up in, whether it's Bradford or whether it's Rotherham, who have waited too long, in my view, for things to feel like they're getting better. We're going to talk a little bit more about politics, but I just wanted to... Uh, take you back to June 2016. This is a, a happy memory, I assume. <laughs> you revealed on Twitter that you were in a happy same-sex relationship. You previously had relationships with men. Mm -hmm. So talk me through what changed or perhaps nothing changed. Perhaps sexuality is just fluid. Put it in your own words. I think I just met someone who I fell in love with and it was as simple as that. And actually... I think it's just such a good example of, of you just have to follow how you feel about something and be happy, actually. And that is the most important thing, I think, in anyone's life. You know, you, you put a lot of your time into work, into things that you might care about. But fundamentally, <laughs> you should be doing things that make you happy. And, and so when I met Tess, I, I, I did kind of think, 
God, I, I can kind of tell how I'm feeling, but you know, maybe that was a bit of a surprise, but I just thought, well, this is too important to me to sort of think, well, hang on, that doesn't quite fit with, you know, um, what I was expecting. So there you go. And we're still together, still really happy. So yeah, but it was, um, I think, a, I think that moment when I was, I'd done the tweet, but I hadn't pressed, I hadn't touched that bit of screen. You know, I just remember thinking somehow my life's going to change. And I thought based on everyone else I'd, I'd kind of listened to, people like David Mondell, who's a really great mate of mine in cabinet, I thought it would change for the better. But before you do that, you're not sure. And really none of us should have to go through any of this actually. But I think whilst we're on that journey, then I'm part of how we can normalize things and make people realize it really isn't <laughs> such a big deal. In fact, it's probably not that interesting. Um, so yeah, I remember thinking, right, this will be different afterwards. I'm not sure how it was different, way better. So much better. And you'd been in the relationship with Tess for several years before mm -hmm. you went public. What held you back? Oh, just, I think, worrying about what people would say. And also, I think I just wanted a bit of space, if I'm honest, for something that was maybe really important to me. And I, and I thought, actually, if I'm happy and we're happy, then I, I'm not sure I need to do an announcement. But after a while, I thought... Actually, if I don't, I'm part of the problem, aren't I? Because I'm kind of giving an impression that I think there's an issue when I don't think there is. So I just thought, right, let's just get on with it. And you're a very senior politician at the time. Did any of your colleagues treat you differently? No. I mean, I think this is the whole thing. I got this flood of lovely response from Parliament. And I remember Yvette Cooper coming up to me and, and from cabinet colleagues and from the wider world. I mean... It was, it was to some extent, you know, felt it wasn't at all a non-event, but actually in terms of for other people in that situation, it just was better afterwards. You, you know, going back to what I campaign on, on social mobility, you literally, you can't be at your best if you can't be yourself. There were, there were personal interviews as a cabinet minister I just didn't do because I just thought, what am I going to say if they say in passing, oh, you know, and you were in a relationship, Justine, and... And I just thought, and I, I, I couldn't ever lie. Do you see what I mean? I, I, that would have been un, in, untenable for me. So I tended to not do any of that stuff. And I just thought, this is ridiculous. <laughs> so, so I sort of, you know, you, you, being open, I think, is really important for people to be themselves at work. Right, back to politics. So we're in a period of strikes. Um, in two of the sectors where we're seeing strikes, schools, and transport, they were cabinet positions that you held. Would you, at a time of industrial unrest, get around the table with those with the, with the unions that are striking to try and hammer out a deal? I'd I'd always get around the table with them, and not when things went wrong and there was a strike. So. I remember seeing people like Bob Crow, and that's how I got to know Francis O'Grady when I was at Transport. TUC um, General Secretary. TUC General Secretary. We ended up looking at the work we could do together on getting more women into transport. Um, you know, my dad worked in British Seal. He, he was on strike, you know, in the 1980s. I don't think he wanted to be on strike, but he was. And so I grew up in a community where I really understood and saw the role that unions played. I didn't always agree with how they used that power in a sense, but I, un I also understood for bad reasons and how my dad was treated often at work, why those sorts of conditions for people really, really matter. So now I'd, I, I'd, I'd always enjoyed seeing the unions and, and particularly the teaching unions. And my pitch to them was, there's bound to be areas where we disagree, but actually let's never let that stop us from working on the stuff that we all passionately do agree on and we can make some progress on. And, and actually, you know, we're grown ups, aren't we? We're not going to agree on everything. They, they would always understand there was an affordability issue on pay. But what I needed to do as a Secretary of State was to understand where they were coming from and understand the broader issues in the workplace and to what extent you know, I can go there, maybe on pay, but I, but it's easy for me to try and take other steps that can also help. And I think that's just seeing 
how you can meet people on their own terms, but at least doing it understanding where they're coming from and not having a disagreement because you haven't bothered to even find out really where they're coming from. Now, social mobility um, is your life story, but it's also been your passion, your hallmark throughout politics, and it is what you have dedicated your life to post-parliament. So you run the Social Mobility Pledge, which works with businesses, get, get, gets businesses to sign up to how they can be better um, at social mobility in their workforce. Is there a particular company that stands out to you that you work with that, that you think that company really gets shop floor to top floor? I can think of one that's, um, it, it does facilities management and it genuinely has worked out how a, a huge diverse workforce that it has can get in and get on and get right to the top. And in an era where we're all talking about cost of living, all of that really matters. You know, you can argue that the, there are no low paid roles, only employers who haven't worked out how people in those roles get the next step up the ladder and get not just the, the learning and development they need, but the confidence and the support and, and if you like, the, the additional stuff to be able to always say, right, here's where I go next. Um, that for me is really important. And the Social Mobility Pledge was about really getting companies to think as innovatively about people as they had done about planet in a nutshell, Gloria. And I was saying to them, look, every single one of your, um, your opportunities can change a life. And so if I think about what happened to my own life after I left the education system and how I was able to progress, all of that was in the private sector. And so there were all businesses I worked for who, who kind of took a decision about what opportunity I could get next. So my point to them was, you're actually going to be the people who deliver levelling up. And even if I'd been ed education secretary and closed every gap that happens in the education system, my pitch to them was and is, if you're not open to that wider talent pool, then we won't drive levelling up. We talk about social mobility, we tend to think about education, which is, of course, correct. But this issue of employment and opportunity has really been a black box. And you spent a long time in politics as I did. And really, we just tend to talk about unemployment levels, don't we? We're not really talking about almost this quality of work and can the role you're in open up the next step for you? And is that fair at the moment? And the answer is, it's not always fair. And opportunities aren't always open. And tackling that's a key way that will drive social mobility. Good luck with that. It's been a Thank pleasure to, to chat to you. Covered a lot of ground. Thank you, Justine Greeny. Thanks for having me.